How can the empty tomb change my life? So what? And does it change my life? Can it make a difference for me? In most cases, empty is not good. Have you noticed that? I was on my way to the sunrise service this morning, and my gas tank, the, the, it runs out at a quarter, okay? It runs out at a quarter. I look down there, it's 5.30 in the morning, and it says, and it's over here on this side of quarter. Here, I'll show you this way. It's on this side of quarter. That means I'm running on fumes. Empty's not good, is it? <laughs> Especially when it comes to your gas tank and you have to get somewhere. By the way, um, I, I'm, I've got ADD, right? I get distracted. And as I see faces in here this morning, I'm tempted to run over, give you all hugs and greetings and stuff like that. So I'm just telling you, okay, if I get distracted, you understand. And, and just right now, everybody just, you know, thank you, Bill, for the hug, okay? I'm just hugging you all, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. In most cases, empty is not good. Here's one, an empty stomach, right? I mean, start to growl, right? I mean, it can really start to affect you. And, and An empty soul. Spiritual emptiness. An empty house when somebody you loved is no longer there. Empty is not good, except in this case. When is empty a good thing? When you come to a tomb that's supposed to have a dead person in it and it's empty because they're alive. Yeah. Then empty is good. So what that the tomb is empty? It means that Jesus Christ is alive and Jesus who have said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. In other words, Jesus wants to give us abundant life right now. He wants to give us hope and joy right now. We only get that because the tomb is empty. So is so what meaningful for you today? Well, let's continue to talk about that. The ladies are coming to the tomb. I'm going to be reading from Mark, the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. You might remember that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had actually bought spices and put them in, but it was really just a temporary thing so that the body wouldn't stink too bad when they came back to do the full rituals that they needed to do to prepare and finish preparing a body for burial. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Three ladies. Now I know, ladies, you're stronger than guys, right? Oh, come on, a little, little more response there, right? <laughs> Girls, aren't you stronger than guys? Come on, any of you go through childbirth, you know you're stronger, right? <laughs> right? <clears throat> Three ladies, though, are not strong enough to move this big stone. That's an example of uh, it's known as Jezreel's tomb. It's just outside of Jerusalem. And that stone, this is actually a smaller stone. This, this stone's only about that high. Not too big, right? Well, but here's the thing. When they rolled these stones, they set them on an incline. Closing it, putting the stone in front of the tomb was kind of easy. Rolling it uphill was not. And this, then there's a, go ahead, next one, please. This is a slide at what's known uh, today as the garden tomb. And incidentally, it, for those of you who are really looking close here, you might actually make out that there's actually like a circle around there. Can any of you see that? That was probably the size of the stone. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. They say that it would take in like 20 people to move one of these stones, especially to move it uphill. And so to push it up, it would take 20 people. There were 16 soldiers there. I guess if you add the three ladies, maybe they can move it up. But even that would have been difficult. The ladies are wondering, how are we going to get into the tomb? 
Matthew, describing the same scene, said, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The garden tomb is a mile or two outside of the, 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 the old city, Jerusalem. It's actually a place I mentioned a couple weeks ago where there's actually on the hillside in the rocks, it looks literally like a skull. Where was Jesus crucified? At the place of the skull. Now, this may or may not be the place where Jesus was. By the way, that is an empty tomb, incidentally. Hewn out of rock. In a garden where only rich people would have had their tombs. That's interesting, too. So, those of us who have more of a... Of, of a how should I say? Well, turn to the next slide and you'll see what I mean. This is the location that we believe was the real garden tomb. Can you see the cave? Well, if you look closely there, um, no, you can't see it. <laughs> you go through that doorway and you'll get inside a little bit and then there's a hewn out of rock is a place where there could have been a body. It's an empty tomb as well. This is right near where they believe Calvary was. Um, Calvary's also covered over uh, Golgotha, the place where the cross went in, the rock and all. That's all hidden also by a big church. The Church of the Sepulchre sits over this. Uh, it's an amazing location, but it's really kind of hard to see. That's why those of us who just uh, want to have some more worship when it comes to thinking about the Easter tomb the, like to go to the other one. This is the, the, the site that we believe was it, but you can't even tell it. In fact, that has become a building now. If, if, if I showed you another picture, which I didn't put in there, it, you back away and you see that this is actually a building about, uh, about the size of this part of the room. So that means they've moved the rock and whatever else was a part of the mountainside there and covered it with buildings and all. Who is going to move the stone, the ladies say? And when they get there, the stone has been rolled away. Why? Because the angel says, he's not here. He's risen. He's alive again. Mark 4, 16 going on. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Look, see the place where they laid him. Matthew, speaking of the same scene, says, The angel said to the woman, Women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And today you can still go. Pick either one. The fact is both of these tombs are empty. Because Christ's tomb is empty because he's no longer there. How can the empty tomb change my life? So what, the, the, the actor said. God took and moved that big heavy stu tomb, stone. Why? Not so that Jesus could get out. It wasn't because he couldn't get out of there. He's already risen. But God takes, sends an angel and an earthquake. And the stone rolls back so that these women and we could enter the tomb and see that Jesus Christ is alive, that he is risen. It's for us to get in. You see, what Jesus is trying to show us and what God's proving by what he did is that God moves the heavy stones of our life. The stone was rolled away to show us God's power to overcome even our greatest barriers. These ladies can't move this stone and you've got probably stones in your life that are difficult to move as well. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and with his resurrection, he proves that he has overcome the greatest enemies of all. The last enemy as Revelation describes it, death, he has overcome. And the resurrection gives us hope because Jesus poured out his pain and frees us of despair. 
Think about it. What are your stones? When we failed or are feeling defeated, the resurrection offers us evidence that God will turn the worst of events into something very special. How else could God promise to cause all things to work together for good for those who love Him, who are called according to Christ and for His purposes? God, God, on Easter, think about this. God wants to remove our stones, the stones we're facing. I already mentioned it. What's, what's one of the big ones? Death. Revelation 20, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Yesterday, my friend Peter, treasurer for this church, saw Jesus face to face again. Peter used to say, I had so many questions. I finally reached a point where I just knew I was not going to get all my questions answered. And finally came to a place where I simply said, I have to choose to believe in God because I'm never going to get all my questions answered. Fifteen years ago is when Peter chose to believe in Jesus. The last 15 years almost, he's been the office manager treasurer for our church. And in that 15 years, a man that even his own wife said, I never, never thought Peter would ever accept Jesus. He was such a, such a committed atheist, I just knew he would never accept Jesus. But he realized, because he was a great thinker, <laughs> very numbers-focused, detail-oriented, he said he realized that he was never going to understand it all, but he was going to have to believe in God. And he chose to believe. And for anyone who's known, even his family, who's known Peter these last 15 years, what a difference it made in him. You see, I know that I will see Peter again because of the resurrection, because the tomb is empty. And he, God, has defeated death. Praise the Lord. Oh, and by the way, if he didn't, just go with this for a minute. What if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? What if somehow they really were able to steal his body? Eleven men who were afraid of the soldiers who had gone off in hiding got brave enough in the middle of the night to somehow defeat at least 16 armed soldiers, Roman guards at that, move the big stone, take his body, and hide it somewhere. Where do you hide a dead body? Well, I guess they must have found a place. But then, but then... After they've supposedly then hidden that body, because that's the story that went out, right? That, that they stole his body, and therefore it was in hiding. Well, well that, why, when it's time for them to stand up for Jesus and say, I believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. How did these men, who were afraid, nervous, in hiding, behind locked doors when they're waiting to hear what happened, and they've heard stories already from the women, and, and yet they're still in, locked up in an upper room, and they're wondering, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to us now? And Jesus walks into the room. If he didn't enter that room, how do you explain the fact that all of these 11 men gave up their life in one way or another for Jesus Christ? All but John, who died on the island of Patmos, exiled there, which was not a happy place. 
Every single one of them gives up their life, sacrifices their life. Peter dies upside down. They're stoned to death. John's, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, is beheaded. I mean, all, every single one of them. Okay, wouldn't one of these guys have maybe said, you know, it's not worth it. Let's tell them the truth. Some of the greatest evidence that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead is the fact that those men sacrificed themselves for the truth that they knew because they had seen Jesus personally. He was risen from the dead and he defeated death. But pity us. Pity us if he didn't rise from the dead. That's what Paul says. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then everyone's faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. There's some words in Scripture that are really good. And one of those words is but. If Christ is not raised from the dead, we're, we're to be pitied the most. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, he's the one risen from the dead first. Then we other come, those, then we. Then he comes, those who belong to him. And he continues, and then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. What are some barriers you're struggling with? If you're human one of the barriers you're probably struggling with is sin. Imperfection, failures, missing the mark, not doing your best, somehow not being the best person you can be. And even the goodest, I am saying that intentionally, even the goodest person is not good enough. Every single one of us has something, someplace, somewhere where we've messed up and not been everything we ourselves even wanted to be. Forget about anyone else's measurement. Even we ourselves have a line that we said, I didn't make it. I haven't, I've got regrets. I've got things I haven't done. I've got things, places where I blew it. I simply did wrong. And because of that, not one of us is good enough to get into heaven. Sin separates us from God. Ephesians 2 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. What's the hostility? The dividing wall? It's sin. It's my mess-ups. It's my failures, my shortcomings, my weaknesses. It's any place where I've blown it. That's divided, separated me from God himself. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your, your iniquities, your sin, have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin. It separates us from God. And the separation is now and forever unless we repent. But then I got thinking, you know, it's not just my sins. It's the sins of other people sometimes. That's a wall for me, isn't it? Most of you grew up in a very perfect home, correct? With perfect parents. Some of you have your parents here, so just look and say yes, yes. It'll be safer if you just nod yes right now, okay? Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Sins of others are a wall, a stone in our life that sometimes we really struggle with. Particularly the sins of family members. They're the sins I think we remember the longest. Now, we forget ours. 
But we can remember what a brother or sister did when they locked us in that cabinet or when they <laughs> tripped us with that bicycle or when they messed up our, mo our, our cars that we had made and stole our bike and broke it and let the dog out when they shouldn't have. And I mean, we remember what they did. Memory's kind of failing me on things I did, but, uh, but we remember what they did. But we also remember what mom and dad have done too, don't we? And the sad thing is, sometimes it's the sins of others that become a huge stone in our life. In fact, even this one. Many a person, some of the times, people who will only come at Easter time are people who have been wounded by somebody in the body of Christ. Because the problem is the church is an imperfect place full of imperfect people. From, from pastors to parking lot attendants to the people working in the kitchen, it's full of imperfect people. And the sad thing is, is that the sins of others can come, sometimes become this great stone that's in the way. And who is going to remove that stone? Ephesians says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And he's saying, look, because of what Jesus has done for us, we want to be different. We want to change our behavior and all. And there again, some of us don't allow family members to change. Some of us still remember the family member decades ago and their behavior there. And instead, like we know we've changed, we still think they're the same. And it holds us back. And then verse 26 says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. For some of us, we have a stone that is blocking us from moving forward. And it's a stone of bitterness. A stone of bitterness that comes from hurt that's been done to us by somebody we cared about, somebody we respected, somebody we valued. It's the sins of others that are a stone keeping us from enjoying the resurrection. How can the empty tomb change my life, they said? So what? That Jesus, that the tomb is empty? Well, one of our big challenges may be our unbelief. Do you have a hard time believing that Jesus is God? You have a hard time believing that he really is risen from the dead? This is what Peter struggled with. He says, you know, I just couldn't understand all this. <laughs> By the way, he and I used to have lots of debates over evolution <laughs> and creation. And how could God have done all this? How could there be a God out there that made all this? I don't know, Peter. All I know is he did because he's much greater than I am. And I don't think we're going to totally be able to comprehend everything. We're not going to get all of our questions answered. And that's where Peter came to. I'm not going to get it all figured out. I'm going to choose to believe. But do you have problems believing? Questions? You know, if you're really being honest, isn't that what they did in the movie? If I'm really going to be honest with you, what difference does this make? If we're really going to be honest, we all have questions. And we all probably have doubts. And we sometimes try to understand how could an eternal God outside of beyond the universe, I mean, we're seeing pictures in the, from the telescopes and all, how could a God beyond all that create all that? How could a God who is bigger than all of that and had such incredible power, how could he put himself into one little tiny human on one little tiny planet that is meaningless just in this solar system and practically non-existent when it comes to the universe? And forget about it when you talk about the next universe. How could God place himself in one human body? And how could he die? 
And how could he rise from the dead? And unbelief may be a stone that is in our way, and we need help to have that stone removed. John said, I've spoken, this is Jesus actually in John chapter 3. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? You know who he's talking to? Nicodemus, the very man who helped bury him on the day he was crucified. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. No one else understands death and life like Jesus, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. In case you don't know the story, they were sick because they were getting bit by snakes, poisonous snakes, people were dying, and Moses said, okay, look, I'm put a snake up on a rod. By the way, it's a sign of, of um, medicine, right? I'm put a snake up on a rod, and you look at that, that rod, and every time you see that, if you got bit by a snake, you'll be healed, and they were. It says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Can I just say, I read earlier from Revelation and there's a book called the Book of Life and not everyone is forced to have their names in that book. But only those who have said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. God will not force you to go to heaven if you choose not to believe. He's offering it to you. He's wanting you to come, but he will not force it. And here's the thing. None of us are good enough to get our names written in that book. You look around the room, and, and, and you're all making judgments about people here, right? And you're judging some people as, oh, they're really a good person over there. How do you know? And then you're probably looking at somebody else. Well, they're probably one of the ones that are you know, not so good. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> and here's the fact. is Not one of us is good enough to get our names in that book. It's Jesus who writes our name there because we choose to believe. That's what Peter did. And that would be what he would be inviting us to do. Choose to believe. How can the empty tomb change my life? Especially, how can the empty tomb change my life when all I've done so, had so many failures in my life? When I've messed up so many times, when, when I've blown it in, in so many different ways. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Why in the world does the angel say, you, ladies, you, you need to go back to the disciples. Tell them I'm alive. Tell them that, excuse me, that Jesus is alive. Oh, hey, girls, you need to also say that specifically to Peter. Why does the angel, why does God tell the angel to single out this one man? It's because the night that Jesus was, before he was crucified, Peter had been warned by Jesus. Peter, you're going to betray, excuse me, you're going to deny me. You're going to reject me more than once, three different times. You're going to hear the rooster crow. And on that night that that happened, Jesus looks at Peter and sees him in the eye to eye. And Peter leaves a broken failure, wounded, hurting, despairing. In fact, now all these reports that Jesus is alive is not making him happy at all. Because for Jesus, he failed, and he now needs to face him. If he's alive, oh my God, I have to face God. A failure. I strongly said, I'd never reject him. I'd stand up for him. I pulled out that knife. I cut off that man's ear. I was going to live and do everything I could for him, and I failed. And Jesus wants to remove the stone of failure in all our lives. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely 
by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And then verse 27, I'm in Romans 3, 23. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No. Because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Because no one perfectly does good. All of us have failed and fallen short. By the way, how good do you have to be if goodness gets you into heaven? If you're out in the woods with a friend and you see a bear coming at you, how good do you have to run just faster than the other person with you. <laughs> How good do you have to be to get into heaven? Because you're not going to outrun. <laughs> because we've all failed, fallen short of the glory of God. What will you do personally today? What will you do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? You could do like, like Lee Strobel and you could try to disprove it. And I, I urge you, please, do the research. Try to prove that Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead. I should warn you, it may lead you to faith. <laughs> exactly like it did for Lee. What will you do with the resurrection? Well, as the ladies stood there listening to this angel, verse 8 says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. What will you do with the resurrection? Say nothing to anyone because you're afraid? Afraid that it could be true? Or afraid that people will laugh at you? Afraid that people will say, but Peter, you're, you're an atheist, man. What in the world are you doing trying to say you're going to now become a Christian? What will you do with the resurrection? Yes, what difference does that empty tomb mean to us? Could I just ask you one more time? What are the stones that you're facing? You personally. Not the person next to you. But you. What are the stones that, that you are facing? Is it, is it anger? Angry because of what somebody's done to you? Is it guilt? Shame and embarrassment because of choices you've made that you just can't get past? Is it addiction? Something that you keep giving yourself over to? And by the way, it's not just addiction to drugs, folks, that we have to be concerned about. We can be addicted to power. We can, some of us can be addicted to shopping, addictions to porn. There's addictions to food. No, no, no one here, sorry. <laughs> There's all kinds of addictions, things that we're battling with. What, what is your stone that you need Jesus to roll away for you? Is it, is it disappointment? You're disappointed because you, you, and I think I've turned off right now. Is it disappointment that you're facing because of something that, that's happened in your life? You haven't met the goals that you had for yourself, the dreams that you have. Maybe you wanted that marriage to succeed and it didn't succeed. Or are you discouraged? Or here's what, are you afraid? Is fear gripping you? Do you get anxious when you go out into some setting? You know, is fear taking a hold of you and is it beating you up? Is that your stone that God wants to roll away? Is it stress that you're facing? The decisions you're trying to make, and there's just too many, and you can't handle all the weight of this pressure. The doctor's talking to you about stuff. Your health is failing, and, and the stress and the pain of it is getting you down. What is your stone? Or is it grief? Is it the fact that somebody you love 
loved so much and they died and you still have not been able to forgive God? Is the pain so intense that you're still hurting? What is the stone, that great and mighty stone that only God can move because God wants to move your stone today? How can the empty tomb change my life? Can't. Can't. Unless you let Jesus move the stone. Unless you choose to say yes to him. It's a choice we make to believe. And then once we believe, we receive what God wants to give to us. And because we receive, then we become a follower of Jesus Christ. And you may become like Peter in the last days. I shared this at sunrise this morning. One of the last times that Peter was really able to communicate, and he wasn't doing that well, but one of the last things was earlier this week. He's, by Wednesday, he was on morphine every hour. But before that, he started asking for a book. A book. And then it was a yellow book. Yellow book. A yellow book. And they finally understood. He's saying yellow book. Now they're like, okay, but what does that mean? And then Anne remembered that Peter came home with a book. On Monday, he was actually, I think it was Monday, it was either Monday or Friday, I can't remember. He actually was here in the office. And he came home with this yellow book, this one of these right here. The book is titled, The Case for Christ Answer Booklet. <laughs> really fitting for Peter, okay? <laughs> really fitting, because he's got a bunch of questions in here that you're asking God, and here's the answer booklet. And this is built on the movie, The Case for Christ. I encourage you to consider watching that and seeing it. 